I mean, at, now I'm kind of at the point where it doesn't even feel like those stories are mine. Like, I've been called out, I think, by both of you and other people that I don't tell my story enough. And I'm like, it doesn't even feel like my story anymore. That It's not even a disassociation with it. It's that it doesn't affect my life negatively. And that has been a journey. It has been a process. And there are parts that still show up in my life sometimes. And it's just about recognizing it and dealing with it almost immediately. Welcome to the Face Your Freedom Show, where we talk all about creating a life of freedom, walking your own path, and pursuing your purpose. My name is Alan Howard. And I'm James Weston. We are two entrepreneurs best known for taking a leap off the beaten path and pursuing a life of freedom and self-discovery. Let's get into it. What's up, guys? And welcome to the Face Your Freedom Show. As always, you have Alan Howard. I'm here with my co-host, James Weston. And we have an awesome guest here today, a great friend of both of ours, an incredible person. Brittany Martinson has joined the show today. Welcome, James, you want to tell them about her a little bit? Absolutely. So... Guys, Brittany is really interesting. She's uh, She's been location independent for over five years now. She's lived in over 30 different countries, what it is now. And um, she has been involved in multiple seven-figure startups. Now, besides all of her business and lifestyle success, the real reason why we wanted her on the show is because Brittany really is someone who has faced her freedom in life. She's been through a lot of struggles. She's been through a lot of life, so to say. And um, there's a lot to learn from her. Um, from basically living on the streets at a very young age, um, being kicked out of her house in high school, to being losing her virginity in a gang rape, to being on an island that got hit with one of the worst hurricanes in history. Brittany's kind of been through it all. <laughs> so there's a lot to learn from her, and I'm super excited to have you on the show. Welcome. Thank you. It's so good to be here. As always, being in your presence is an extreme honor. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. I think one of the first things that I kind of want to get into or at least ask you is um, I've seen kind of your evolution over our friendship over the last year and a half or so. Um, what first made you get the courage to be able to leave the traditional work life and actually start pursuing your, your freedom when it comes to location independence? What was that like for you? So... Location independence began for me in 2015. At the time, I was uh, working with my friend Amber at the Vitality Center. Nice. It was a brick and mortar healthcare center in Denver, Colorado, and I loved it. I loved everything about it. I loved working with my friend Amber. I loved the work that we were doing, healing people from chronic diseases and illnesses. And in my personal life, she taught me what love was. It was a great yeah. period of my life, and yet. I just had this deep sense of knowingness that I needed to like, make a transition and I wanted to live uh, to my fullest desire, which was at the time traveling. And so I had no idea what I was going to do or how I was going to make it happen. I just thought in my mind, like, what would the perfect life look like for me? And the answer was, I just want to work remotely and travel full time. And so. Wow. I announced to her that I was going to leave. She supported it unconditionally. Fastly is Amber Hollis, I love you. <laughs> and, <laughs> and then as soon as I made that decision, everything just fell into place. And it was such a good example of uh, trusting yourself, trusting your intuition and giving up good for great because Whoa. the things that occurred wouldn't have if I didn't make the, make the leap, make the jump into the unknown. Cool. Yeah. Very cool. Can what were some of your fears in that? Because you said you're willing to give up good for great. So I'm sure in that moment there's some hesitancy to step into that kind of new life. What were some things that you were struggling with at the time? The very classical things like money and career, which all seems so <laughs> ridiculous now, but it's a it's a true fear that you experience when you're fully participating in that environment. And so it was it was a fear of you don't actually know that great's gonna come along. You're giving up something very good and you could end up worse off. It's just, it's a possibility yeah. that you you could tap into. And the different possibilities and variances of the future are entirely related to, I think, at least for me, uh, my frequency, my energy, like where I'm tapped in. And so I didn't realize that at the time. And, and so I knew that there was one of possibility in which I would end up worse off. So I would be giving yeah. up good for for bad <laughs> and I was just so that's what the inherent risk like um, I could not have a job I could take a step back in my career I could 
not travel at all for years yeah. like you never know what's gonna happen That's, be, be homeless again could be homeless again which you know is a period <laughs> of profound peace for me so like i should welcome that yeah your uh your perspective on that part of your life is really interesting um you want to kind of go into that a little bit talk about how that ended up being your life especially at such a young age and kind of how you got out of that and yeah I can absolutely go into that um, first. I just want to see if you guys are familiar with um, David Hawking's, his um, hierarchy of emotions that he correlates entirely to consciousness. Yes. Not You're su- familiar. Not super familiar now. Yeah, yeah, but let's explain for the audience because they're probably not. <laughs> Got it. So it's basically just a theory in which all humans are, are looking for moments of enlightenment, of higher consciousness, of greater vibrational frequency in our bodies and in our life. And so he correlates that uh, directly with the emotions that we experience. So there's lower Mm -hmm. emotions with lower frequency and higher emotions like love and peace and joy with higher frequency that we associate with higher forms of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And so the lower emotions are like anger and fear. And Mm -hmm. most paths to enlightenment or paths to higher forms of consciousness are getting through those lower emotions so you do plant medicine it takes you to the lowest of lows and you start tackling those lower forms of emotion Mm -hmm. Uh, same with meditation etc etc for me my my path to moments of enlightenment has mostly been rooted in my life and fully participating in life and having those experiences and so one of those experiences as you've mentioned was uh, living on the streets and being homeless when i was in high school and at that time, I was tackling the like emotion of just like fear and embracing the unknown and anger at the people that I was associating me with getting me to that place. And what I really found was just profound peace. And it was a path to a higher form of consciousness, a higher emotion. Tell me how, how you found peace through that struggle. Um, it, was that something that you found peace because you found yourself or you realize that you're there with yourself no matter what? Like what, it, what does that mean to find peace in that type of situation? Oh, there's so many ways I want to um, digress into that, but I'll answer your question directly. Yeah. Uh, for women, having a sense of self is one of the most rare things. That's mostly like a masculine quality. Oh. So I wouldn't say that I, I found myself. I would say that I was thrown into trusting And that's all it was, is just trusting that when I needed food, I would have it. Trusting when I needed a place to stay, I would have a pillow Mm -hmm. to rest my head. I would have shelter in the cold. I would make my way to school. I would make my way to wherever I needed to be at the beginning, was like dancing. And so I could make my way to the company. And And make your way to school at that time. You were in high school. Yeah, make my way to school. I was in in my senior year of high school. Okay. Hmm. Yeah, so it was just about experiencing trust and seeing firsthand. There's a difference between um, understanding something conceptually and experiencing it. Completely. And for me, I can say a deep truth for me is that whatever you want to call it, God, the universe, the source, I'm just going to go for the rest of this conversation with the universe because it's the most (laughs) universal, LOL. (laughs) And (laughs) so just trusting that the universe is made of love and fully on your side yeah it has your back so that's kind of like an interesting angle to take because like you know you end up in this really rough position early in your life a lot of people would be like the universe clearly doesn't have my back right (laughs) yeah something's out to get me yeah and a lot of people go down that how did you shift that was that the original thought process and then eventually you shifted it or like what went through there or was that not even something that crossed your mind I mean, it really didn't cross my mind. Like, I think I had a pretty firm belief system at the time that everything was going to work out. I just believed it. I had already at that point been through, through traumas. Like I went through non-consensual losing of virginity, which anecdote, losing virginity, I hate it. I prefer my sexual debut and we can 
in the show notes maybe <laughs> talk about why <laughs> sexual debut and sexual debut sexual uh, debut yeah okay. it takes power back like if it's virginity it's, it's associated with like yeah. yeah you're losing something you probably have no control over it you can never get it back and it's just a concept yeah. like i'm not my vagina isn't fundamentally different because there was a penis in it for the first time like yeah okay yeah. <laughs> <laughs> at, at any rate so like that had been something i already went through so i I would say that was probably a really a low low and I'd also been through like other experiences I traveled abroad for the first time to Sri Lanka when I was 11 and Cambodia when I was 12 and some pretty dire experiences I was that was that with your family uh no they did not attend and okay. I went with like a medical missions trip wow yeah I, know that. I learned to draw blood and test patients for AIDS, AIDS and malaria when I was 12 years old wow. <laughs> I had my own station it was that's awesome. incredible wow. yeah Wow. So, like, I've already experienced at that point of my life just the fluidity of it and that everything is temporary and there's a lot of change. And so just going with the flow was my mantra at the time and getting through, getting through high school. What, one thing that I would like to maybe, like, just transition a little bit, I think we're going to come back to that discussion, is uh, maybe how we met, how all how you met me and then how you met James first first impressions yeah, opinions totally. things like that cuz i think it's it's good background for the audience to kind of understand how how we all got to be here today um, you know one of the things that i i really recognize is we met at like a nomad a digital nomad dinner here in medellin uh, we happened to i think sit near each other or we found we we sat next to each other the next time people moved and i remember at the time you and i ended up having like one of the most powerful just locked in conversations for like over an hour together. And at least for me, it had been a long time since I had a conversation like that with someone. And I remember just like feeling so connected with you in that, in that moment. And it was, it, it was funny and it was depthful and it was all these different things. And I knew from like that moment forward, I'm like, I'm going to be friends with her. We're going to hang out. Um, so that was my perception of our, our first meeting. I'd love to, I'd love to hear yours as well. <laughs> Yeah, so uh, we were at a dinner um, that my friend, I had just flown into Medellin from Cape Town and I was with my friend Frida and we were, she dragged me to this dinner <laughs> and I, you came in and I was like, look at that chiseled Roman statue that's like <laughs> golden. <laughs> and oh, I remember like at the time we were all like having, supposed to have conversations and meet each other and somebody would yell like a keyword and we would all switch seats and at the next time we were supposed to switch seats, you just like pointed at me and you were like, B, and I was like, <laughs> <laughs> Stadia wants to talk to me, okay. <laughs> and so I came over and I remember just like, yeah, uh, going into a really depthful conversation. And it is rare because we can only meet other people as deeply as we meet ourselves. And mm -hmm. we both had met ourselves pretty deeply by that point. Yeah. And so we were able to like share that with one another. And and then I remember going back to the apartment with Frida. I love you, Frida. <laughs> and uh, we were like, we picked out the people we wanted to be friends with. And yeah. we were like, all right, Alan, I'm going to, we like, I'm going to tackle Alan. And then so like every, each one of us had like a group of people that we were going to try to be friends with. Nice. <laughs> nice. Oh, and then we just ran into each other when we were getting ice cream one day and we were like, oh, we just saw this place we want to live at. And you're like, can I move in with you? And I said, yep. <laughs> yeah. And then we were roommates. <laughs> yeah, you sold it more than that. You're like, we found this huge penthouse. There's a hot tub on the balcony. You know, we're going to have a chef. We're going to have this. And I'm like, okay, they're already really cool. This sounds like a, an, an epic experience. So, yeah. yeah, we moved in together probably like three weeks after that yep. point. And uh, that was last year. So it's been, it's been, a, good, it's Time been a good ride. Yeah. yeah. How about for you, James? Meeting Brittany? Yeah. Meeting Brittany was an experience for yeah. sure. <laughs> Uh, it's funny because like I had heard a lot about Brittany from you yep. and from our other like mutual friends and then finally um, you guys had a barbecue at the uh, at the penthouse that you're talking about yep. Yep. and um, I, I went there and you and I ran into each other and there was just like a kind of like like a weird energy when I had met you like not a bad energy just something that I'd never felt before from anybody else and I remember like one of the first things that you asked me like I like went into like some just general small talk, just like, what's up, you know, all that kind of stuff. And then you're just like, so what are you? And I'm like, what am I? Like, what kind of question is that in my head? And yeah. I was like, I was honestly like 
a bit intimidated by the question because I was like, I don't have an answer for this. Um, and I think what I said to you, I was just like, I don't think I can like describe that in words. I don't really know what that is. But in my head, I was just like, is that like a deep question that she uses to like test people or like figure out where they're <laughs> yeah. at in their life and all that kind of stuff? I'm just like, Logical wow, what is, what is all that? <laughs> and like we talked about it later and you're like, no, I'm just curious what you were. Like you weren't even thinking, you know, past that question. Yep. Um, and so we talked for a little bit and then I kind of like politely was like, all right, I'm going to go like mingle with other people. And she's like, oh, you're uncomfortable talking to me. That's completely fine. No worries. I'll talk to you later. And I was like, wow, this girl is very comfortable in her own skin. This girl is totally cool with just like saying whatever's on her mind and all that stuff, <laughs> which made me even more uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. And um, the funny part was that like we really didn't click that much the first like two or three times that we hung out. And then it was really just like a matter of like a lot of familiarity and like being in groups together and all that yeah. kind of stuff. And then finally we got some like one-on-one -on -one time and then we ended up like cultivating this like strong friendship. So how about you? <laughs> <laughs> It's interesting you mention that just because I think like meeting people, I just, it does not interest me like what you do for a living or how old you are. I just want to know like, and I probably never articulate this. I want to know what you ache for. If you dare dream of meeting your heart's desire, if you have touched the center of your own sorrow and if you've let life's betrayals open you or if you've become shut and withered for fear of further rejection, I want to know if you are willing to risk looking like a fool for love, for the adventure of being alive, for your dream. Let's go. <laughs> yes. Well, why didn't you just ask that? <laughs> we were easy to do it, but uh. I do remember that interaction yeah. of, and I just, I had never, so like from my perspective, I just actually genuinely wanted to know. I was like, I'm so intrigued by you. Like, what are you or who are you? Just like, I asked you what I wanted to know from you. Mm. And, and then I, can totally attest there was no click. <laughs> I was just like, we'll let that one slide. Yeah. I will put no resources. Yeah. <laughs> no effort or resources going that direction. <laughs> yeah. But, but I, I love that question you asked because, right, it's, it's not who are you, which is a normal question. It's what are you? And I think the way a lot of people are going to hear that and respond is be like, well, what do you mean? I'm a human. Or like, right? I'm or, yeah, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a business owner, or whatever. But like the way you ask that question, and it, it is piercing, and it's different, and it starts the path to a completely different conversation. I've seen you do that a lot of times when we've had friends over to the house. I had one of my sales guys show up, and I don't remember what you asked him, but it was like I think it might have been like, "What are you afraid of?" It was just like something like really powerful, and he was like, "Whoa, no one's asked me that right off the start." And yeah. like that ability to be comfortable enough in your own skin to be able to have those type of conversations allows you to cultivate this community around you of people who really love you for exactly who you are. Yeah. And I think that's such a cool quality is like Brittany is Brittany 100% the way through and the people around you love you because they see you exactly as you are. And even to the point, I'm going to tell a little story. I took you to a, uh, <laughs> I took you to an event last week. One of my friends, Alejandra was, was hosting an event at her house and it was like a, um, it was all about like dating online and social media and stuff. And you and I both arrived a little bit late. Uh, we got there and it was like an intimate group, like 12 people sitting around in a circle. And it's always like as you come in late and everyone knows each other, it's a little bit uncomfortable in that group. And so you could feel that energy kind of uncomfortable. And we sit down and uh, they started asking us a couple questions, like really basic questions like what's your favorite ice cream? Uh, what do you do for work? All these things we went around in a circle. And it got to you and the question was, what's your favorite activity to do after work? And without hesitation to the group we didn't know, you were like, a, a ceremonious masturbation session. <laughs> I like to do that right after work. And the entire room just went silent, dead <laughs> quiet. And then all of a sudden, I just started cracking up laughing because I'm like, yes, that's, that's so you. And I think that's something that I look at and really respect about you is like living your truth, being Brittany all the way through and and to to form this into a question where did that come from and when did that happen for you wow that's a great question <laughs> first you hit me with all this honey roasting and yeah. then like warm me up and then <laughs> hit me with a question you can respond to the honey roasting first <laughs> if you want. i love yeah. you too yeah. <laughs> i really do i love you guys so much yeah being here is very special yeah um, when did that start? I, I think actually, as I alluded to earlier, a big difference between men and women 
is a uh, sense of self. Like for a man, your entire life is unraveling and discovering your sense of self. Mm. Women are the, we are the adapters of the species. We can adapt and change who we are in any moment. Yep. And both of these are great things in their own way. It's just for a woman to have a sense of self is a luxury and a true act of human spirit with the people that are around her. And so when you say, I appreciate that you're your full self around me, what you're saying is that you've given me that allowance. I don't know if I'm like it all the time. I mean, maybe I'll get to that point someday. <laughs> but when a, you see a woman around you who is her full authentic self, it's because you have just given a true act of human spirit and gave it that to her as a gift. Wow. Yeah, so thank you. Both. That's awesome. Wow. Yeah. Huh. I got some more questions. <laughs> or at least more thoughts. So one of the things that I, I've seen in your own personal evolution that's been really powerful is you come from the corporate world in the U.S. You're a high achiever. You've done really well in business. You've kicked ass. Like I, I really look up to you and admire you for your business savvy as well. And uh, I noticed when I first met you that there was an underlying feeling of competition with men. And dare I say a little bit of like, maybe frustration and anger with men because there is a patriarchy that exists in, in our country. I think we're aware of that. Um, but one of the most powerful things that I've seen, and it's really un, unraveled your power, at least I, I bloomed your power, not unraveled your power, is that you've been able over this last year to build incredible relationships with men around you that are not in competition, but that are in love and collaboration. And um, I know so many women in the States that deal with that same struggle, the struggle of like frustrated about patriarchy existing, but are burdened down by it emotionally. And I've seen you be able to completely transform that. You have all these men around you that are like pushing you up, they respecting really you, getting your advice. And so what was the transition from Brittany who was angry with men to Brittany now who is like, completely embraced herself and in very strong collaboration with a lot of men around her. Mm. You are that transition, Alan. Wow. <laughs> are you serious? <laughs> yeah, of course. I mean, I can elaborate a little bit just to give yeah. uh, uh, people like tools for them to use at home. But aside from that, yeah, you played a really big part in my life and you came in at a perfect time and living with you helped me make that transition. Wow. Thank you. I appreciate that. I was not expecting that. Yeah. I would. <laughs> what, what, what else, uh, I guess, about that? How, how have you approached it differently or what, what changed internally for you? Well, can, can we get like a better understanding, I'd say, of like what that's like for a woman? Because like, I don't know how that feels. Maybe you, you know what I'm saying? I'm sure that people listening like can relate with it. But what does it feel like as a woman to compete with men or to be in like a business setting and have to worry about stuff like that or think you need to? Yeah, that's a really great question. Um, I'll start with just the masculine and the feminine. The work environment is set up by the masculine for the masculine to thrive, which is like full on go mode, single focused. And as a woman, you're, or as anyone, you're expected to wake up and perform the same every single day because men do. And women just simply do not, <laughs> which makes us seem, or at least we're perceived as um, unreliable. You never know like what's going to happen next, mm. not predictable. And so to that, there is a cycle that we go through and are on. And I'm happy to talk about that just to any woman listening or anyone that manages women. Uh, we have a very short cycle in which mm. our the way that we work changes. Uh, the other thing is... What, what do you mean by that? Like from week to week? Yeah. Okay. okay. So we'll get into that. Yeah. Just okay. right now, we'll dive right in. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so we all know that women have a cycle, our period. Yeah. And it's like a monthly cycle, 28, 30 days. It varies from person to person. Uh, men also have a cycle. It's just more of like a once in a lifetime cycle. So it's a much longer cycle. And so for women, our short cycle means that Every week we're a little bit different and it's different per woman. For me, I can, when I'm on my period, it's like hibernation mode. Everything in my body is like, oh, buckle down or like, oh, be in your bed. So it's like you are rejuvenating 
-hmm. your body and your mind and your spirit. The week after that for me is springtime. Like this is the time where I am the most idealistic. I'm percolating ideas. I am creative. I am problem solving. And in that period of, of time, like, I will far exceed any man trying to do that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and then a the, little bit of competition still left. We like this. <laughs> Let's go. Healthy competition. Yeah, yeah, Healthy yeah. competition. <laughs> Actually, I do have a note to say yeah. about competition. But to continue this thought, the next week is summer, which is my go mode. So, like, I think women do have a natural go mode. It's yep. like one week out of the month. <laughs> yes. Yeah. And for me, it's that time. And then. Uh, the week after that is fall, and it's when we're tying up loose ends. Like, you'll see, like, oh, I need to finish up this project. Like, I have a lot of energy to do that. I know winter's coming. I need to, like, finish up a lot of things. And so knowing that about myself and how I work and my body and having the freedom to have use that information to do my work schedule and be measured on performance and results and not have to wake up and perform the exact same every day has been a big contributor to my success. Well, mm. yeah. respecting the cycles that you have and listening to your body and actually treating it with the respect. Yeah, exactly. And in regards to competition, what really changed that and what you showed me was that men are very single focused. Women diffused awareness. <laughs> but when a man is single focused, if he is competing with you, he cannot cherish you. Mm. It's as simple as that. And I was like, Alan, I much prefer it when you cherish me. I'm done competing. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Yeah. And, and recognizing that I, I really don't have to compete with men. Um, I can stand in my own power. And I can recognize the differences and celebrate the differences between men and women and interact in a way that honors both of our genders. I remember something that you had said to me around the competition thing is that by trying to compete with men in like a masculine energy, you're, you're limiting yourself, right? Because you're, you're trying to create something that maybe you don't have as much of and then trying to compete on their playing field. So something that I've seen you really step into in your life and it's transitioned to relationships. I think it's kind of made business go a lot better for you too is like stepping into your feminine and recognizing that power within uh, the workplace and your personal life as well. How did you do that? What are some steps to maybe step more into your feminine? Um, what was that transition process for you? I'd love to. I would love to hear a little bit more about that. Absolutely. Uh, so just to maybe get all on the same page in terminology, even though it is just semantics, I think that women do have an equal amount of like masculine and feminine. Uh, it's like a muscle. Mm -hmm. You can tap into one, you can tap into the other, but eventually if you are in an asana or in a position for a very long time, that becomes your natural state. And so we do have the capacity to be in our masculine all of the time. We do have our capacity to be in our feminine all the time and we have the capacity to oscillate between them at will. And so the real difference, at least for me, is that we don't have enough testosterone, which is the fuel for go mode. And so when women produce testosterone, we produce it from our adrenal glands, which also re uh, releases adrenaline and or our ovaries. And so we will literally die from the inside if we are in our masculine all of the time. Whoa. Yeah. Whoa. It's, it's very serious. Like we will literally have organ failure if we are in our masculine all of the time. And it's tough because women are trying to be independent and to have jobs and to make a life like have be single mothers like it's it's tough because you are rec you are paying a cost you are paying a price for that and so for me i was like i'm not willing to give that up it's still very important to me how do i work in a state of feminine energy and so something that i do is just learning to transition between masculine and feminine and for me that looks just like a a ritual so <laughs> that you already talked about <laughs> <laughs> And then just post, post work ritual, my post work ritual. Okay. And, but now it's kind of like, um, mid work because I'm also transitioning of working in my feminine. And so what does that mean? 
it means that um, I might not be in a state of like go mode or I might not be in a state of like produce, produce, produce. I usually do that for a block of time in the morning and early afternoon. And then I save creative projects, um, things that require more emotional EQ to be in my feminine. And so I'll do that more in the afternoons. And then I started seeing just throughout the rest of my life, because the masculine was my primary position, what became most natural to me, I was in my masculine all of the time. And so I had to cut a lot of that stuff out of my life initially. That's what it looked like, which mm -hmm. meant like uh, running our household, outsourcing all of that to someone else to do, putting on events requires masculine energy. Um, even different types of working out require masculine energy. So it was for me, I was like, I will be in my masculine 30 hours a week and that's it. And I give it all <laughs> to work. So, <laughs> so the rest of the time, wild card. <laughs> yeah, love that. Yeah. Got it. It. So when we talk about like, like inferiority, let's say, right? Because I feel like there's a lot of like cultural inferiority when it comes to like masculine, feminine, and like women are often put down and stuff like that. And what I'm what I'm seeing, like kind of hearing from what you're saying is that it's not so much that there's one, you know, masculine is inferior or feminine is, is uh, what would be the opposite of inferior, like um, superior. exalted, superior, 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 yeah. me, superior right? <laughs> So it's not really like one or another. It's not like a polarity type thing. It's really about like learning how to embrace what you have within you and take what you have and then use it in the best way possible. And that's kind of what you've learned to do, to paraphrase and make it kind of simple. <laughs> yeah. And the only other, I guess, distinction I would make is that I have the capacity for both. And so I am getting to choose what I want to work out more. Like, is it leg day or am I working my triceps? <laughs> like, you get sure. to pick. <laughs> it's bulking season. It's bulky season <laughs> all the time. <laughs> and and so it's not even just a matter of like work with what you've got. Like you get to co-create your life. You get to co-create your reality and you get to co-create your destiny. Hmm. So something that you and I talked about recently is the concept of like being independent, right? Being interdependent, being codependent, all these different things that people struggle with. Right. And then also relying on other people and how to balance all these different things, because I think especially I know as, as a man, being independent is a definite part of my ego per se. Like I want to be very independent. I want to be self-sufficient, all that kind of stuff. But then you say there's also like you kind of challenge that. And you're like, there's also like a, a fine line between where that becomes unhealthy and it actually limits you. So what's your philosophy on independence, self-sufficiency, all that kind of stuff? I think that they're often used as synonyms, but they're very different. We confuse self-reliance with independence. And so when people talk about independence, what I think they're really talking about is self-reliance. They don't want to rely on anyone else. And I think that's healthy to a point. Like once you prove to yourself and you realize you have the ability to be in, in your own power and to be reliant on yourself in the world, that's great. But that's not the end game. Like that's step number two. <laughs> mm. And so beyond that is learning how you can use reliance on other people to achieve more independence. And so I think the analogy I used with you was um, a child playing on the playground and about how a child could be playing on the playground and see the mother sitting off in the corner and just be very adventurous. Like I'm going to swing higher and jump off I'm going to glance at my mom to make sure she's there because the child knows she'll kiss any boo-boo. Like, <laughs> so the child knows the mother is going to kiss, kiss her boo-boo if it gets hurt. The mother is, goes away. The child's glancing around. Where is, where is my mom? Throws a tantrum. And at that point, we would be like, okay, the child needs to become self-reliant. Okay, maybe they do. But they're never going to be as brazen. They're never going to be as brave. They're never going to take as much risk. So when you have people in your life that you can rely on, you will be more independent. You will be more or less risk adverse. You will be willing to try out more things and you can go farther together than you could ever go by yourself. And that's well, yeah, why we can use relationships as springboards into higher consciousness, as mirrors for healing, and as, like, I don't know, long distance runners for success. <laughs> I like that, yeah. I like that. Gotcha. Very cool. So it's, it's like you said, it's like step two is learning how to really become independent and then step three through ten is really learning how to utilize other people in order to really evolve as a person and reach higher levels of growth a great synopsis cool awesome what, one thing that I, i've been curious about is you've you've gone through as as we talked about in the intro 
you've gone through some really big, um, devastating, by societal standards, um, events. like events in your life, right? Uh, from from losing your virginity in a gang rape to being on an island with one of the worst hurricanes ever. Um, how have you been able to deal with those things and not have them be things that have pulled you down and destroyed you, but actually things that have catapulted you up into the person you are today? Um, just talk us through that process a little bit and feel free to share as much as you want about those events as you'd and, like. And if, if I can interject just before you answer that is like a lot of times like knowing your story and then meeting you, I would be like, can't be the same person. Like you would think that someone who's been through the events that you've been through in your life, that they would show up as a different person every day. And I'm sure that like there's women listening, men listening that have been through traumatic events, been through all these different things and like they carry it with them for the rest of their life. They don't really ever fully heal from it. So I think what we're kind of trying to figure out is like, what was that process for you? Um, how long did you carry that stuff for? What was it even like, were you carrying it? All of that. We want to kind of know what was going on in your head. How did you end up where you are today? Where you meet you and it's like you'd have no idea that you ever went through all that yeah i mean at, now i'm kind of at the point where it doesn't even feel like those stories are mine like i've been called out i think by both of you and other people that i don't tell my story enough and i'm like it doesn't even feel like my story anymore that it's not even a disassociation with it it's that it doesn't affect my life negatively and that has been a journey it has been a process and there are parts that still show up in my life sometimes and it's just about recognizing it and dealing with it almost immediately i think a good example would be when we were in santa marta we were like in a living room i don't even know what we were doing all of, just all of a sudden like got up and i was like i'm going for a walk it was very mm -hmm. abrupt yeah, I <laughs> and i was just like dealing with something like very tiny that came up. It's about recognizing like the microscopic things well, and, and dealing with that. That, 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 was, that was triggered by something. Yeah, it was, it was triggered. We were reading poetry to each other <laughs> <laughs> and it was this poem. I don't even remember what it was, but something about like, once you've been lost at sea, if you survive, you'll still never be the same. And I was like, I'm not the same. <laughs> <laughs> and then she just bolts Bolted. <laughs> right out the door. Wow. Yeah, and so I think if I could use an analogy, because a lot of people might not be able to like um, connect as deeply to extreme scenarios. So I will mm -hmm. just say like something that we all have in common, mistakes. Yep. We all have mistakes. And I think it's just about recognizing that a mis justice is paying for a mistake once. Injustice is paying for a mistake multiple times. And that's what we do as humans. We carry around our mistakes. I'm like, oh, I made that mistake. If the world didn't make me pay for it, I'm gonna make myself pay for it emotionally. And in either case, I'm going to continue carrying it around and make myself pay for it every time I remember it or in a, in a similar situation. And people are doing that with their traumas, with their mistakes, with all negative things. And it's because we're living by a programmed collective imagination in which the rule book is rooted and predicated in fear and war and violence and anger and hatred. Like, do we ever ask ourselves why it's so difficult living in this world? It's because this inherited rule book is ruled by fear. Who wants to live like that? Mm. And so I guess the short, succinct answer to your question is grace. Grace is when you allow your mistakes to serve a purpose instead of serving shame. And I guess I could say that's what I did with my trauma. Well. Wow. Grace with yourself, grace with others. Yeah. So, Brittany, I definitely want to continue this conversation. I know Alan does too. Um, just to let the audience know, we had a couple of tech issues before we started. We were supposed to start this episode probably about an hour ago or so. Yeah. Um, and we all have pretty much meetings coming up and different stuff that we can't rearrange. So um, what we decided to do is we're actually going to kind of break this episode up into two. We're going to have Brittany come back next week and dive a little bit deeper because I feel like we've just kind of touched the surface of some of the stuff yeah, that too. we want to get into with her. Um, so why don't we do that? Before we do that, though, I do want to, um, Brittany has something coming up. It's something that I've kind of been encouraging her to do. Alan, too, is, you know, Brittany, you have such an incredible story. So many things that, like, I think people can learn from you. And one of the things that I've been kind of pushing her to do is, like, share her story more and then also open up, you know, a little availability to help other women and people that are kind of struggling with some of the things that she may have struggled with earlier in her life. So you want to tell us a little bit about, like, what you have going on coming up in the next week or so here in Medellin and what you're going to be working on? I would love to. 
I am testing out some content. I just made an outline. So basically, I'll be doing a six-week course. Uh, the first week is about working in your feminine, which is something we kind of talked about today, and some rituals to practice doing that. Uh, the second week is about understanding men. I love you guys. Yes. <laughs> and uh, the third week will be about relationships and how to have conscious, loving relationships in your life. And the fourth week is about awakening and what to expect inside of your body as a woman now that you are awakening and have this new information. And then the final week, I'm putting you both on the spot, is a men's panel. And I hope you guys will come. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Amen. <laughs> Yes, yeah. and so the interest meeting is the 27th, which is the day this episode drops. So if you don't make it, not a big deal. If you do want to join, I just need an email address, and I'll give you a calendar invite with all the information. And it is here in Medellin. A few people have been asking if they can zoom in, so I'm just going to open that up, too. If you are abroad and you want to zoom in, I'm getting nervous. Like I, <laughs> You're going to kill it. I've never done anything like this before, yeah. just as a caveat. Yeah. <laughs> It's just a testing out some of this information and, and sharing it with people and hopefully you can get something great out of it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's definitely something that, um, that like I said, we've, we've been encouraging Brittany to kind of look into. And so we're really excited that she's kind of stepping into it. So cool. And then and what's the best way for people to get in contact with you if they're interested in doing that? Yeah, you can find me on Instagram at Brittany Martinson. Okay. Um, also, I would highly encourage you to go to, go to the uh, Face Your Freedom Instagram page and find me through there. Make sure you're following them because they're producing some amazing content. I really look up to you both and I'm so happy to be here. Thank you. Yeah. Appreciate awesome. that. And yeah. we'll, we'll put your Instagram in the show notes below. So if you guys are watching this, uh, whatever platform, uh, check the show notes and you can have a link right there to, to Brittany's Instagram. Uh, we're going to do part two of this next week. I'm looking forward to it. There's a lot more we need to dive into, a lot more for you to share, a lot more of your story I want to be able to unravel. So thank you so much for, for coming this week. Any any last thoughts on your end, James? That's it, man. I'm looking okay. forward to it. Thanks so much for being here, Brittany. I have one last thought oh. because we did talk about all of our relationships and how we met, and I really just left it with James and I didn't connect, but I want <laughs> everyone to know we are so connected now. We're like this. I love him dearly. I look up to him, and I'm very glad you're in my life. Aww. Awesome. Beautiful. Thank you guys so much. Thank you, Brittany. Thanks for joining us. Appreciate it. We'll see you guys next week.